Valentine's Day. Following that's a bit hard. <laughs> I want to begin by thanking the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe peoples for hosting us on their traditional lands today. <laughs> Do something that scares you every day. Who said that? It wasn't Evo Knievel with a record 433 broken bones in his lifetime. It wasn't Steve Irwin, the crocodile hunter. Ugh. It was Eleanor Roosevelt, not your death-defying kind of lady that we normally think of. Before multilateralism, before women's rights, child rights, civil rights was a cool thing to do, Eleanor Roosevelt was leading this in deep and profound ways. I wanted to start with her because she thought about the world in completely different terms. And she's also not our typical vision of a change maker, so I wanted to make that point. Her advice is the base of the talk I want to give today. And it's not fear of jumping out of a plane or jumping through a uh, ring of fire. It's not about jumping into uncharted waters, lots of jumping. It's about engaging with difference. It's about breaking down those barriers between you and another person. I want to talk about two instances in my life when I was deeply uncomfortable and what they taught me and changed my life afterwards. So, get uncomfortable. When I was 17, the height of anyone's uncomfortableness in their life, <laughs> I, of course, was going to be a star athlete, and then, you know, life happened. And I was going to be a teacher, because those were the people who I saw who had transformative effects on the people I knew. My sense of responsibility, my social and civic circles, really extended to my family and friends. And if I was completely honest, those people shared my same religious, cultural, ethnic, language, and social classes myself. And that bubble was formed not through fear of the other, but really just out of comfort with the familiar. It's because we share the same language, the same history, the same culture, the same reference points, and ultimately we all shared a mother who wanted us to be a doctor and a lawyer simultaneously. <laughs> Though I recently discovered that's actually a universal trait of motherhood. I'm sure Todd's mother can, can testify to that. Uh, uh, but that all changed one day in a grade 12 politics class when a teacher showed a film. And now all the educators in the room are like, I told you it's still teaching if I show a movie. <laughs> and that film was about the Rwandan genocide, about the 10 year anniversary of the Rwandan genocide. And in the film, Lieutenant General Romeo Dallaire, who I didn't know at that point, but I think we all know him to be the saint that he is, talked about how the genocidians in the radio would talk about Tutsis as Inyenzi which means cockroaches. And in that one word, that one moment, my entire bubble was burst, and I was deeply uncomfortable. I was deeply uncomfortable because the word cockroaches reminded me about how my grandparents were referred to as vermin to be exterminated. And suddenly that bubble burst and my circle expanded. It also made me deeply uncomfortable because the Rwandan genocide had happened during my time and I knew nothing about it. I had let myself know nothing about it. It also made me feel uncomfortable because I felt like I had betrayed that sacred oath that I made to my grandparents' generation, which was to say, never again. And that brings me to the first important lesson and the first important trait that we have to deal with difference, which is imagination. Imagination is such a powerful tool because it lets Strangers, faceless strangers far across the world become people most dear to you. And it allows you to bridge that chasm. It allows you to burst that bubble. Adrian Clarkson in the La Fontaine Baldwin Lectures talking about a society of difference. How do we live in a society of difference? Says imagination is key. It allows us to imagine ourselves in the other. And a, a way that expresses itself is that it also lets us build solidarity with those we don't know. Because ultimately, if the only people I care about are the people I know, then the entire fabric of our society and our globalized world falls apart. And it allows us to build solidarity because even though I've never been homeless, I can understand that at such a small level, that cold that someone can feel when they're on the street and have nowhere to go. 
It allows me to understand, even though I've never been in a civil war, the fear a child must have being bombarded in South Sudan or Syria. It even allows us to, and so many people on this stage have done that, imagine future generations and the challenges they'll face from climate inaction. And the beauty of that is that that imagination can come from anywhere. It can come from those moments. But the trait in those moments typically is at those moments where we're uncomfortable. Those moments when our boundaries are and our bubbles are burst and challenged. And you can think about it, those moments come from music, poetry, art, and so it's, it's a question for us of, do we have the courage to seek out those moments? After that movie, my entire life changed, I, uh, I'm not a teacher, uh, but I got involved in the global fight against poverty and I worked across the world and I, I tried to learn from people who were facing with incredible courage, insurmountable challenges. And the incredible thing, just learning from so many people, is something interesting was happening. So many of these people in societies were shaped by beliefs, by faith communities, who could be the underpinning for great goodness or terrible things, or looking at the history of terrible things. And along this time, someone said, you should get involved in interfaith work. And I said, absolutely not. <laughs> interfaith work for me was old gray-haired men talking about theology, really doesn't have a solution most times, and, uh, and about how we're all the same, and we're all just peace-loving and a lot of kumbaya, and that wasn't something, you'd be surprised how many meetings I've been in that reflect that, um, but then this new opportunity came about, and this was a different kind of opportunity, it was about young people, it was about men and women, it was about action, it was about putting faith into action, and it was... It was about celebrating differences. It wasn't about skirting into the side, oh, well, that's fine, we all think those different things, but at the root, we're all this. It was about celebrating those differences. How do we approach things differently? And I got so excited by this, and I decided to join this fellowship. I took a leap of faith, and I was uncomfortable, and I got into interfaith work. And the beauty of that experience, uh, it was 20, 30 people working across three countries on eliminating deaths from malaria. Why malaria? Because as a bishop in the pink collar once told me, a mosquito that goes to mosque on Friday, goes to synagogue on Saturday, goes to church on Sunday, and stops in and at a meeting of atheists on Monday. <laughs> and so should it, the response to this preventable disease reflect the same level of solidarity? And so I spent the last five years working with volunteers and people from all across the world who saw their faith not as a force for bad, not as a force of exclusion, but as a force for good. Ibu Patel, the founder of the Interfaith Youth Corps, which I was trained by, talks about there's four expressions for faith in the modern world, generally speaking. There's a bubble and a barrier of isolation and division. People can see that. There's a bomb of destruction, which unfortunately gets too much of the news headlines. And then there's the bridge to cooperation. And that's what the last five years has been about, of seeing so many examples, examples, countless examples across the world of people who saw their faith as a bridge to cooperation, serving others not in spite of their faith, but because of their faith. And so it was a really exciting time. And this is a challenge for our society, is not how do we live in a diverse society. Diversity is a fact of our society. Diana Eck from Harvard's Pluralism Project talks about pluralism being the act of engagement with difference, not simply recognizing and acknowledging difference, not necessarily accepting differences, but understanding and celebrating them at points. And so I want to give you three ways that this could shape our society. Number one, we'll be a much more creative nation, right? Different ideas, different worldviews coming together. Head is a perfect example for that. It's just a diversity of ideas. Secondly, we'll be able to solve complex problems because we'll have diverse viewpoints and diverse solutions. Because ultimately, if you want to think differently about a problem, it's probably helpful to have people who think differently from you. Kind of self-evident, but we don't do it. It's <laughs> often. Uh, and then the third way is that we'll be a much more inclusive nation. So we, we talk a big game about how diversity is welcome here, but we see too many examples of when people are marginalized and pushed to the side. And so what it's going to require is the courage to actually actively engage in that difference with respect. Um, and I'm going to give you three really practical examples of that, how you can walk out of here and do that. 
The first is don't unfriend your friends who you disagree with. <laughs> it's so tempting, trust me, I have a lot of people that, it, who I just want to be like, oh, unfriend. And, and this is a researcher who looked into the last Gaza conflict and tracked social media and how different people were talking. And what he noticed was the clusters is people basically talking to people who already agreed with them. It's a big challenge, because if we're actually going to solve problems, two sides of a, or the multiple sides of a problem might have to talk to each other. So don't unfriend people who hold different beliefs than you, or different sides of the equation. And to be honest, we all, the best case study for this is your family, right? I don't know about you guys, but I'm blessed with an incredibly extended family of people who I disagree with profoundly. <laughs> and that experience has shaped so much of what I know, and it has challenged me in wonderful ways. And so that's a great example. The second example is two visions of how diversity will play out in our nation, and this is all taken from the last year. After the Illinois shooting, a group of people in Alberta decided that Muslims in Alberta were to blame for the madman in Ottawa, who, by the way, was rejected from a lot of mosques because he was too extreme. And they sent a very clear message, which was, go home, even though. And then on the other side, those are people who don't think diversity and difference is a good thing for our country. On the other side, on the right side, were people who wanted to send a profound message, which is, you are home. That is the country I want to live in. And to do that, yeah, okay. Examples. We need people to stand up and take those leaps of faith, to be <coughs> courageous, to be put in uncomfortable zones. That doesn't mean ditching your beliefs or your ideas or, or accepting all of them, but to engage with this realm. And the final way that it comes about, and there's a reason why I wanted to do TEDx Queen's View, or that I was excited, because university is the hotbed for this. It is the perfect world to engage in this world, in, in a diversity of beliefs. Because if you think about it, university is a radical encounter with different concepts, different beliefs, people questioning. There, you walk into your student union building, it's so easy to go to something, to have those moments. I want to end with something that I've been enriched with through this experience. And if I think about it, if I hadn't taken those leaps of faith, if I hadn't been uncomfortable, I wouldn't have. I feel like I would have been robbed of something, something beautiful. It's a quote from the Quran which says, O oh humanity, we have created you from a male and female and made you into nations and tribes so that you may know one another. We must come to know one another. It's going to be scary, but it will be worth it. Thank you.